after a very good meal and after a very good music, thank you very much to the band. I think it's time now to introduce a distinguished guest and a distinguished colleague. And this colleague is Dr. Michael Nyberg. I've heard a lot of him, but never met him before. And so it is even a greater pleasure to introduce him here. He is a very distinguished scholar with a very remarkable research record. Born in 1969, we can always say he's still a young man. <laughs> and uh, he received his BA at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, his MA at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, his hometown, as, as I learned. And he became a professor of history uh, at the Uni US Air Force Academy. Well, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> and sorry, sorry to the Air Force. <laughs> sorry to the Air Force. And uh, he then swapped over to the Army. Well, as a former Army officer, I would also say, well, you could have made a better choice. And eventually, I hope you will end up in the Navy. So nevertheless, uh, he is uh, at the, after being at the Southern University of Mississippi in Hattiesburg, he has been now for many, many years a professor at uh, the Army War College at Carlisle. And what is more important, he's not only a very good and distinguished professor at a university teaching courses, but he is also a very productive historian. And this is what makes it interesting for us to meet him here. He has, uh, by, for example, published a wonderful book Dance of the Furies, Europe's, Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, which many call one of the five best books written on this topic. He has also written uh, a book on the blood of free men, a history of the liberation of Paris in 1944. And just to make clear that he has a really enormous, vast sc scope of uh, scholarship, he has eventually uh, published a book on Potsdam, that's where we come from. You should really come and see us. It's just next door where, we, where this was, uh, meeting took place. It's just next door. It's, it's another imperial palace on Potsdam, the end of World War II and the remaking of Europe. And what is also not, of course, uh, should not be overseen is that he has a, another book which has just come out is uh, the... Um, Path to War, A History of American Responses to the Great War, 1914-1917. So, Michael, this is the topic you are going to talk about. It's about American entry into World War I. I said a few words in the morning, but I think I can learn a lot from you uh, now in the evening. Michael, come and join us, uh, give your talk, and uh, it will be a pleasure uh, to listen to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, for what they call a, an introduction only a mother could believe. So thank you very much. Um, I want to start with a really big thanks to Holger, to Lorraine, to David, to Nancy especially, and to Stephanie for all the hospitality that folks here in Alberta have extended to me over my couple of visits here. It is always a tremendous pleasure to come here to Canada, to come here to Alberta, and it's been an honor to be a very small part of all the great things that are going on here at the University of Calgary. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. Uh, when, uh, when Holger first asked me if I would come and give this talk, um, I realized I had absolutely no connection to Vimy Ridge except for the coincidence of timing that American entry into World War I occurs within, literally within hours of Vimy Ridge. Um, I asked Holger if that was what he had in mind. Uh, Holger said yes, so I'm going to talk about the book that Michael was kind enough to mention and look at American entry into the First World War in the time that I have here with you. Um, this is a subject that uh, I learned absolutely nothing of value about in high school, in college, or in graduate school. There were one of two explanations. Either the Lusitania sank in May of 1915, and somehow that led us into war two years later, but it was approximate cause, or Woodrow Wilson sort of woke up one day and said, we're going to war. Um, so what I did in this book is I tried to look bottom up, that, by which I mean, I tried to look at what the American people themselves were thinking, feeling, reading, understanding, processing, as a way to get another perspective and another way into understanding uh, this moment. And so what I'd like to do with you here is show you a little part of that 
and then explain maybe why I think this way of looking at the First World War matters, why it presents a different and more efficient picture, a more predictive picture of American entry into World War I than uh, the standard narratives have done. So this is just a picture postcard cartoon from 1915, just to, just to start the talk off. It has an American bull terrier there, and it says, I'm neutral, but I'm not afraid of any of them. And uh, as I'll talk about in just a little bit, uh, one of the problems with this kind of a mentality is the absolute unpreparedness of the United States for military action in 1915. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go forward. What I really want to do is take you on a small journey. Um, this man is Walter Hines Page. He was a North Carolina newspaperman, one of the first to back Woodrow Wilson for the presidency in the election of 1912. Wilson made him ambassador to Great Britain shortly after becoming president. In August of 1914, with Europe descending into war, Walter Hines Page wrote Wilson a letter that ended with this sentence. Now and ever, I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean. Thank God we are out of it. Now, barely over a year later, in October of 1915, Walter Hines Page wrote this letter to Woodrow Wilson. If Germany wins, the Monroe Doctrine will be shot through. We shall have to have a great army and navy. And as I have to explain to my colleagues at the Army War College, he meant this negatively. He meant that the United States would start to have to pay for security, which was something the Americans had taken for granted. In another part of this letter, Page said to Wilson, we'll have to decide whether we want to build one battleship or one college per year. And it was obvious which of those two Walter Hines Page preferred. But suppose that England wins. We shall then have merely an academic dispute with her. It is a matter of life or death for English-speaking civilization. And what I want to do is track the journey that Walter Hines Page went through a little faster than most Americans um, from, thank God we are out of it, to life or death for English-speaking civilization. Now, I could have picked others that went through a similar process, but Page went through it a little quicker and a little more eloquently than most Americans did. In 1916, Page was so worried that Wilson wasn't taking this issue seriously enough that he left England and came to Washington, D.C. to try to meet with the president, who avoided him. So Page went to Shadow Lawn, which was President Wilson's home on the Jersey Shore, and literally sat on the, on the president's front porch waiting for him to come home. Right? Remarkable stuff. Now, along the way, I want to dispel a couple of myths that at least I heard or learned or appear in the literature one of those is that the American people weren't paying any attention to the First World War, that we were isolationist on our side of the Atlantic Ocean, and nothing could be further from the truth. Americans knew from the moment that the First World War broke out that it was the biggest event they were likely to see in their lifetimes. Those Americans who were old enough to remember the Civil War compared it to that as early as August of 1914, and the war began to affect Americans right from the very start. The New York Stock Exchange had to close its doors, so did Chicago and so did Philadelphia, out of fear that the European great powers would sell their securities, convert that money into gold, and then take the gold back to Europe. In order to prevent that from happening, the stock exchanges of the three major American uh, markets in 1914 closed and did not reopen again until November of 1914, sending the American economy into what became a temporary tailspin, but a tailspin nonetheless. Newspapers advertised things like this. This is an ad for the, the dispatches that would come from Richard Harding Davis, easily the most famous American correspondent of his age, a good friend of Teddy Roosevelt's, and a man who bragged that he had covered every major war over the last 25 years. And near as I can figure, he did. They knew, the American people did, that this war was going to affect them. Now, as I'll show, that didn't mean they wanted to get involved in the war, but the notion that they were ignoring it is silly. Most Americans favored the Allies from the start, for reasons that I'll discuss here in just a bit. Seeing the Germans as the aggressor state, taking a small diplomatic crisis in the Balkans, and pushing it to the point that it became a world war. More importantly, most Americans saw the British, the Belgians, and especially the French as defending the principles of democracy and freedom on which they believed their own country was also based. Now, as I'm going to show you here, until 1917, the vast majority of Americans wanted to keep their country out of this war. They wanted to see Germany lose it. They wanted to see the French and British win it. But until the spring of 1917, they did not think it was their war. Now, I'd like to introduce you to one other person. This is Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who later will become known as the American Agatha Christie. 
one of the best-selling writers of her age. Now, I've read her books, including this one, The Circular Staircase. I think there's a reason why people don't read her novels anymore. They're not very good. Um, but in 1914, she was offered a remarkable opportunity. The Saturday Evening Post had arranged for her to become the first female reporter to go into the trenches of the Western Front. They also offered to arrange visits to the Kaiser and his court in Berlin, as well as the court in England, as well as meetings with the French president in Paris. Now the story goes, she repeats it, so do others, that she was in New York City when this offer came up at a dinner, fancy dinner, when her husband said, I forbid you from going. Mary Roberts Reinhardt replied, I do not intend to let the biggest thing of my life go by without having been a part of it. Her husband told the Saturday Evening Post, if you take out a $15,000 life insurance policy on her, I will let her go. <laughs> That's what happened, and she was paid the then enormous sum of $1,000 per dispatch to write for the Saturday Evening Post. She left in late 1914. She came back to the United States an even bigger celebrity, an even wealthier woman, in March of 1915. Now, her journey to Europe typifies the way that many Americans were moving. And I want to talk about really four things here. One, she left the United States wanting to blame both sides, wanting to say this is a plague on all of your houses. She believed that European civilization had allowed something terrible to happen, as I'll talk about here a little bit at the end of the talk. And she wanted to condemn both sides. But the more she saw of the war, the more she blamed the Germans, something Richard Harding Davis also did. Second, she told her readers not to believe the reports coming out of the British media. She told her readers that the British were trying to suck the United States in, that the propaganda the British were feeding to the Americans was clearly not true. Better, she said, to believe the things that we Americans have seen with our own eyes. It's bad enough. Third, she saw early on that if the United States were to get involved in the First World War, then just called the Great War, that the United States would have to do it for its own political and strategic interests. The United States should not get involved in the war, she argued, to help out the British or French, however much the Americans might sympathize. The war was too dangerous, it was too deadly, it would be too costly. Only if American interests were threatened should the United States get involved. And fourth, by the time she came back, she realized that if the United States did get involved in this war, her own country was in no way prepared to fight this war. This is a page from her diary. She came back to the US a great celebrity and just before the sinking of the Lusitania. Now my daughter once brought home a worksheet. One of the questions on it was which event led the United States into World War I? She said, Daddy, which is it? And I said, well, it's none of them, but your teacher wants C, so circle that. <laughs> Bad thing to do. C was the sinking of the Lusitania. Now, the sinking of the Lusitania did not bring the US into World War I. What it did do, though, for people like Mary Roberts Reinhardt is confront the big question. What do you now want to do that American blood has been shed? What do you now do about this war that is showing no signs of ending? Now, Americans had a lot of choices in 1915. Three of them came up. One was the opinion of the American Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who said that what the United States should do is become even more isolationist, to the point of banning Americans from traveling overseas into war zones. A second option came from Theodore Roosevelt, the very aggressive former president and first head of the New York City Police Department, who identified Germany as the criminal and said that the United States should get more involved, even up to the point of risking war with Germany, in order to punish the criminal. The third was the position that Mary Roberts Reinhardt and so many other Americans came to, that what the United States should do is begin to build a large military. What the United States ought to do is build a navy and an army, that great army and navy that Walter Heinz Page was so remorseful at having to build, in order to protect American neutrality, in order to make sure that the great powers of Europe had to take the United States seriously. Now, I'll come back to preparedness in a little bit, but in 1915, what most Americans were envisioning was something like that first cartoon that I showed you, a powerful, strong state that should be taken seriously by everybody. The other analogy that many Americans pointed to was that if you didn't do this, you could end up like China, a state that's very wealthy but unable to defend itself and carved up by the Europeans. Or, as Mary Roberts Reinhardt herself argued, it was possible that whatever state won the war 
would come out of the war nevertheless so bankrupt that it would have to look for the next area to conquer. And that could well be the United States if the US wasn't prepared. And I'll come back to this here in just a bit. Uh, my favorite was a couple of political cartoons that came out in early 1916 depicting the American army they wanted to build as a porcupine. That is an animal able to defend itself but presenting no harm to its neighbors. I'm a city kid. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a nice image. I've never seen a porcupine. I'm going to take their, their word for it. Now, with all due respect to my German colleagues here, American attitudes towards Germany grew harsher and harsher and harsher after the sinking of the Lusitania. This is a cartoon. The, the caption is Alamituns, and it shows the Kaiser with a dripping scimitar wearing an Ottoman fez. It is blaming Germany, not the Ottoman Empire, for the massacre of the Armenians, a subject that drew great sympathy inside the United States. Philadelphia held an Armenia Day that raised $10 million for relief in Armenia. I don't know what, what became of that money. Um, there were also sabotage campaigns run by German agents inside the United States, one of whom, who they later discovered to be just a deranged individual not connected to the German government, attempted to assassinate J.P. Morgan at his home in Long Island. That same man had placed a bomb in the Capitol building that detonated the day before the assassination attempt. Some of you may know that black, uh, about the Black Tom explosion during the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Black Tom is uh, the, the name for the railway depot in Jersey City, New Jersey, where all the munitions produced in cities like Chicago, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, made their way to Europe. In June of 1916, two German agents blew it up in what was the costliest act of American ter terrorism in America before 9-11. The Statue of Liberty's right arm was closed from 1916 until just about four years ago because of the damage it took uh, during this uh, Black Tom incident. In late 1916, the United States government expelled two diplomats, Carl Boy Ed and Franz von Papen, for their involvement in these schemes. Von Papen, of course, became very important as the last German chancellor before Adolf Hitler. There were also allegations that German officials were trying to buy American newspapers. They approached H.L. Mencken about buying his newspaper. Mencken not only refused, after that he stopped writing articles about Germany. There were allegations that German agents were trying to rig American elections. There were intense fears. <laughs> Want a new idea? Read an old book. <laughs> there were intense fears of German intrigue in Mexico and what we would today describe as the failed state of Mexico. When Pancho Villa, the Mexican strongman, invaded New Mexico, he had an American woman with him that he had kidnapped and then released. She later claimed that he was bragging about all the money, support, and weapons that the Germans were giving him. And remember, this is a time period when the great powers are messing with the internal affairs of states on a routine basis, from the Arabian Peninsula to Ireland to anywhere else you care to name. So what the Americans decided to do was begin this process called preparedness, building up American strength so that the United States did not get dragged into a war on anyone else's terms. Now, for reasons that should be obvious to Americans a century later, the reason why this movement happens is not that Americans are isolationist. It's not that Americans are ignoring the war in Europe. It is because the United States Congress could not agree on how to prepare the Army and Navy. So preparedness became a largely private movement. So we think in the United States of these things called the Plattsburgh camps, where young men, most of them Ivy League students, though not all, voluntarily went to the wilds of northern New York to be trained by people like Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt in the rudiments of becoming an officer should the United States have to get involved in the war. Now, nobody from Theodore Roosevelt on down thought this was a way to train officers. What they thought it was was a way to shame the Wilson administration and the U.S. Congress into doing anything. The inability of the U.S. Congress to do this led private individuals to do it. Philadelphia's industrious Powell Evans, who ran uh, some of Pennsylvania's most, uh, United States' most important railroads, uh, began plans for what he called a Committee on Industrial Preparedness. One of the things he wanted to do was get American corporations, 350 of which agreed, to sign onto a plan to continue paying the salaries of any employee that voluntarily went off to take military training. There was a Committee of Scientific Preparedness, led by Thomas Edison. There was a Committee of Medical Preparedness, led by Charles Mayo of the famous Mayo Clinic. Columbia University, led by a pacifist president, in 1916 sent a memo to the faculty listing the Army's G staff system and asking every member of the Columbia faculty to identify where on that G staff system it could, he or she could best help the nation in a time of crisis. Every single member of the Columbia faculty did it. 
faculty at Yale University, imagine this, began doing daily calisthenics on the quad in order to encourage their students to do similar. This is 1916. Now, for reasons that I'd be happy to discuss in Q&A, preparedness ended up producing only half measures. The United States got a slightly larger Navy, it got a Reserve Officer Training Corps program as part of the 1916 National Defense Act, and the United States got a whole heck of a lot of parades. It highlighted the essential American problem. How could the United States be neutral and safe from what many Americans were beginning to describe as the fire in their neighbor's house? Now, Germany had some defenders, the most famous of which was this man, Ugo Munsterberg, born in Danzig, and a very well-known professor at Harvard University, one of America's first criminologists, one of the first people to apply psychological methods to crime. A fascinating, fascinating man um, who never described himself as a German-American, but as a German living in America, a distinction that he was always careful to make. When the war broke out, he began writing letters to President Wilson, open letters in the Boston newspaper. When the Boston newspaper stopped publishing those letters, he hurriedly put together a book. Munsterberg was an interesting guy. He defended Germany. He believed that the war was caused by Russia trying to take away Germany's wealth and that Britain and France were just too stupid to realize they were being patsies to the Russians. He was trying to convince the American people that Russia was the real menace to Europe. However, Munsterberg also had written letters to the Prussian government telling them to tone down the militarist nature of Prussia and to focus instead on German greatness in medicine, science, and especially the thing that fascinated him near the end of his life, the new medium of cinema, which he thought Germany was uniquely positioned to lead the world in. Now, what's interesting to me about the arguments that Munsterberg made were how unpopular they made him. The Boston Public Library is filled with letters written to Munsterberg telling him to tone it down from everybody from the president of Harvard University all the way down to an alumnus of Harvard that offered Harvard the sum of $200,000 if they'd fire him. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me is Munsterberg recognized that there was a sharp difference between Germans born in Germany like him and those Germans born in the United States. Those Germans born in the United States, he argued, had an individualistic mindset and had a hard time understanding Germany. They didn't go back to Germany, they didn't identify with Germany, and therefore, the way he understood it, they had a difficult time understanding the arguments that he made. Now this includes, these German Americans of course, include men like Dwight Eisenhower, Eddie Rickenbacker, John Pershing, who of course did not at all identify with Germany. By 1916, most of the defenders of Germany's position were getting harder and harder to find. Munsterberg himself had a, a way think an aneurysm in the middle of delivering a lecture at Harvard, caused his friends thought by the stress of reconciling his own personal positions with the nature of American public opinion, especially after the sinking of the Lusitania. Shortly after the war, Willa Cather produced this book, One of Ours, which went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature in 1920, which had two characters living in Nebraska, Cloud Wheeler and his German-American neighbor, in which Cather makes sharp distinctions, saying that the families of Nebraska hated the Germans for what they were doing in Europe, but had no anger towards these German-American neighbors, again, until American entry into the war when patterns change dramatically. Now, this view is also reflected among German-Americans themselves. Many of the second wave of German-Americans, that is, those that came to the United States after the 1880s, were themselves non-Prussian. They were disproportionately Catholic, and many of them came to the United States to get away from the very Prussian government that they now saw running Germany. This guy is not an example of that. His grandfather had come to the United States. This is Cardinal George Mundelein, the senior ranking Catholic official, German-American Catholic official in the United States. Mundelein was an interesting guy. In his speeches in 1915 and 1916, he described the conflict between the United States and Germany as a conflict between a man's mother and his wife. Your mother gave birth to you and raised you, but the wife is the person you're living with. And at the end of these sermons, he would always ask the question, if your wife and your mother argue, what do you do? With the answer left unspoken. In September 1916, in response to allegations that German Americans would not defend the United States in the case of an emergency, he wrote, it seems to me that it is rather late in the day to ask the German American to prove his patriotism. He did that more than half a century ago, referring to German American service in the American Civil War. And shortly after writing that, he wrote this, should the US and Germany go to war, the German-American community will support America, 
from the little drummer boy in the orphan asylum to the aged veteran in the old folks' home. Other German-Americans, including Oswald Villard, a German-American newspaper man, argued that American service in the war, even if it were against Germany, might be worthwhile if, as a result, the government in Prussia were humbled and true democracy came to Germany. I can come back to that and talk about it a little more if you like. Now, economics were obviously an enormous part of this. The United States was in recession when the First World War began. By the end of the year, it was coming out of that recession. This cartoon is in April 1915. This is before even the sinking of the Lusitania. This is by John T. McCutcheon of the Chicago Tribune, the first winner of the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. This cartoon is called Coming Our Way. It shows the docks of New York City literally as magnets, pulling the hard currency of Europe back across to this side of the Atlantic. The United States had many senior economic officials writing to Wilson, telling him, if we play our cards right, we can reorient the world economy from London to the United States. Everyone everywhere in the United States was making money. In 1914, per capita income in the United States was $1,164. By 1916, per capita income in the United States was $1,868. Almost anything the American people could grow, produce, manufacture, would be bought by one of the European great powers, most likely Great Britain. On top of that, items that the Americans had gotten used to buying from Europe, they were now buying from other Americans. American Bible salesmen had their record year in 1916 because Americans were now buying Bibles in the United States rather from European printers who were now using their printers to produce military memoranda and the forms that soldiers in the room here, their ancestors, had to fill out ad nauseum. In 1915, Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia signed a deal for $127 million with the Russians. Eddystone Ammunition Company signed deals to sell the British, French, French and French millions of shells and cartridges, as well as a deal from the Pennsylvania National Guard to help prepare the United States. Everyone everywhere was making money. And even in her book, One of Ours, the Wheeler family spends a lot of time monitoring the way that wheat prices keep going up and up and up. This gives you a little bit of an idea represented a little bit differently. American trade balance in 1914, look how quickly that flips from a net negative American trade balance to that enormous $131 million trade surplus by the end of the year. Now, what happens here is two things. First, America's pocketbook, that is where America wants to sell its goods and where it can sell its goods, overlap pretty nicely. American goods can only go to Europe, or most of them can only go to Europe, if they're in British ships. 90% of Pennsylvania's overseas trade before the war went on British ships, and 95% of it was insured by British insurers. That means that American corporations to do business with Europe mostly have to work through the British. And of course, the British controlled at least the surfaces. The second thing it did, however, was ask, force Americans to ask a really difficult question. Mary Roberts Reinhardt put it in one of her articles, do we have the right to fatten on catastrophe? Or as the New York Tribune wrote, have we a right to our present prosperity? What does it say about Americans that the United States was profiting from this war while doing nothing to be involved in the final outcome. And this is a question that, as you might guess, is asked on Sunday mornings in churches, it's asked in newspapers, and it's asked on Capitol Hill. One way to answer it was for Americans to give at least a portion of this new money away to what they saw as the victims of the war. Uh, this is one that I just had a, a, a wonderful time finding, one of these things you come across by accident. Um, this is an ad or a, a notice uh, for Kennywood Park, which is the amusement park in Pittsburgh that I still take my kids to, this is an ad for Serbian Day, where all of the profits brought in that day at Kennywood would go to relief funds in Serbia. Americans gave enormous amounts of money to charity, especially to medical charities and to relief funds. John Wanamaker, the great industrialist in Philadelphia, raised $100 million in 1916 for Belgium alone. The city of Philadelphia raised enough money in one day to buy two entire field hospitals for France. In three hours, New York City's Jewish community raised $250,000 for relief of Jews in Poland. Now, the important thing is that almost all of this money is going to France, Belgium, and Serbia. Almost all of it. 
Some Americans offered more than just their money. These men are part of a group that became known as the Lafayette Escadrille. These are all Americans who were serving in the French army in one fashion or another. When one of them, Billy Thaw, he's the guy with the, just behind the lion cub there. You can't see him. He's the guy with the mustache right back there. Got the idea that what they ought to do is form a volunteer fighter squadron for the French Air Force. This is in 1915, 1916 they do this. Um, most of these guys that you see in this picture are pretty wealthy. They own their own equipment. Billy Thaw was the first man in New York City to own his own airplane. He flew it underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Imagine doing that today. Um, these guys put together an impressive combat record, and they also put together an incredible PR record. That is, they become a news story on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean for reasons that you can probably figure. The French are so happy to have this PR piece on their side that they enforce practically no discipline on these guys, which is why they have the two lion cubs here, whiskey and soda. Um, it's why most of the time they flew in their bathrobes. I have a sense, though I can't prove it, that this is the beginning of the fighter pilot mystique. This kind of culture, I'm not kidding about this, this culture's not there in the French Air Force writ large. It is there in this squadron, because the last thing the French wanted to do was encourage these guys to go somewhere else and fly for the British. These guys also got money from people like Theodore Roosevelt, Cornelius Vanderbilt, to live an incredibly lavish lifestyle. Theodore Roosevelt wrote articles about them in Collier's Magazine, praising them and their American spirit. And they're not the only ones. Alan Seeger, the great poet, Joyce Kilmer, uh, a whole bunch of Americans that volunteered to serve in the French and British armies. At one of the conferences I was at, I think here in Calgary, Jonathan Vance made the argument that as many as 80,000 Americans might have crossed the border into Canada and served in the British Army by enlisting here in Canada. The latest estimates are that many, maybe 20,000 Americans, went to New Orleans and signed up for the French Foreign Legion at the French Consulate there. That's 100,000 Americans putting their lives on the line before U.S. entry into the war. Now, I haven't been able to find more than a handful of records of American citizens doing the same for Austria, Hungary, or Germany. There are German reservists living in the United States that go back but no evidence that I can find of the same spirit. Now, none of this is going to drag the United States into war, so let me do this by showing you what I think did bring the United States into war. And this allows me to bring in a little bit of CanCon into this presentation. Oh, sorry, that's the Lafayette Escadrille Memorial in western Paris, and here's the CanCon. This is the cover image on Life magazine in February of 1916. Now, hang on. I don't think Life magazine was calling Canadians barbarians. Hang on. <laughs> Just go with me for a minute. This is February 1916. The text at the bottom reads, My Country, Tis of Thee. And on the inside, the magazine describes this map as the future of the United States if the United States continues along the path that it's going. Okay? And here, what you can see is that most of the United States is called New Prussia. There are two cities out west, Von Papen and Boyed City, named for those two German attaches that were kicked out. You'll notice that California is referred to, or the West Coast, the entire West Coast, including Washington State, appears as Japonica. Mexico appears as the German-run province of Mexico. And the Atlantic Ocean appears as the Von Tirpitz Ocean. So Michael, there's your naval, there's your naval reference. So let's come back to that barbarians mention here. Here's what I think it's referring to. Again, not that you Canadians are barbarians. The fear that's being produced out of Life magazine, and it's not only in Life magazine, it's in the American discourse more generally, is that if the Germans beat the French and British on the Western Front, what the French and British might do is do what the Europeans have done with North America for centuries. As the price of getting out of the war, they may trade some of their North American possessions. Right? They may give to the Germans, Esquimalt, Halifax, Toronto, as part of a final peace deal. The French might give up Martinique, Guadeloupe, as part of this peace deal. And I want you to remember, 1914 is when the United States opened the Panama Canal. There are real sensitivities to this kind of security. In 1916, the United States bought the Danish Virgin Islands from Denmark and turned them into the US Virgin Islands. The reason they did that was the fear that Germany would either threaten or invade Denmark and make the price of peace those islands. It's in 1914 when the United States first began to study the defense of Puerto Rico, and it's 1916 when the United States began to put the first actual defenses into Puerto Rico. 
The fear is that if the United States continues on the path that it's doing, neutrality will make it less safe, not more. Neutrality will put it into this position. Now, as I said, this sentiment is going through the American political discourse. People are talking about it. They are mostly people on the right, and they're mostly people in the Republican Party, and they're mostly people on the eastern seaboard. People on the other side of the country are either sharing the fear on a lower level or telling these people that they're crazy. A little less than a year later, or actually just about a year later, comes news of the Zimmerman telegram, in which the German government announces to the Mexican government, to the German legation in Mexico, that Germany plans to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. When they do, they expect the United States to declare war. If the US declares war, Germany offers Mexico, if you invade the American Southwest, we will help you get back everything you lost to the United States in the Mexican War of 1846-1848. That's California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, parts of Colorado. It also means that the people who thought that this kind of stuff was paranoia can now see with their own eyes that it's not. And the Zimmerman telegram told the Mexican government, we want you to open negotiations with Japan about a tripartite German-Mexican-Japanese alliance aimed at the United States. In other words, this kind of an image is no longer crackpot theory. It's now part and parcel of the American political discourse. And as some of you know, Arthur, uh, Zimmerman himself was asked, did you actually send that telegram? And as some of you may know, he confirmed that he did. Now, the other thing that the Zimmerman telegram does is it takes the entire western half of the United States, which to this point had been the most in favor of neutrality, and now makes this war not about what happens on the western front, not about what happens at Vimy Ridge, but what happens to their own communities in their own backyard. If you're living in Tucson, Arizona, where, if you're living where David likes to hang out in the nice warm climates of Arizona, if you're living in California, if you're living in Texas, now this war's about you. Now this war's about you in your own backyard. The point is that by the spring of 1917, the American people had concluded that neutrality had made them less safe, not more. It is the Zimmerman telegram that is the final confirmation of that. It is unrestricted submarine warfare that is another example of that. And the third thing that happens in the spring of 1917, which I can talk about a little bit if you'd like, is of course the Russian Revolution. With the Tsar gone, and at least the provisional democratic government under Alexander Kerensky in place, it is possible to talk about a war to make the world safe for democracy. It is possible to talk about a war that will produce something positive at the end of it. And the uh, analogy that many Americans made, though not Woodrow Wilson, interestingly enough, is that just as the American Civil War had begun to prevent secession, it had ended with the destruction of slavery. It may just be possible that this war could produce democracy in Russia, and democracy in Germany. And if so, that's a war worth fighting. Now, I want to stress, what I think this means, what I think this means, and this isn't part of the book except uh, tangentially, what the American people were trying to do in spring of 1917 when they went to war was to stop this. On November 11th, 1918, they believed they had done that. So that on November 12th, what the American people say is, we are now safe from this, get the soldiers back home. What they don't want to do, or what many of them don't want to do, is follow Woodrow Wilson down the line that Woodrow Wilson wants to go. That's a different debate, and a different topic, and a different lecture, and a different book. But to the mindset of most Americans, this is what you were trying to stop. When the Germans lay down your weapons, their weapons, you've achieved it. Right? Setting up this great debate that comes uh, later, it's why, of course, in the United States, we commemorate Armistice Day, what we now call Veterans Day, on November 11th. That's the day that most Americans think the First World War ended. Of course, it didn't, technically, but what did end was any threat that this is going to happen. Now, if you take what I'm saying and you believe anything that I'm saying, then America's late entry into the Second World War comes into sharper focus, and America's involvement in the Middle East comes into sharper focus, I think. I just had this discussion with a colleague. We were talking about why World War II is so better remembered than World War I. And folks, this guy was telling me it's because in World War II we beat such an awful enemy. And I said, well, tell me when the United States knew that enemy was awful. It's well before December 7th, 1941, isn't it? Now let me wrap up and leave some time to take questions. And I know it's been a long day. 
I appreciate your attention, and I know that Mike especially is trying to follow the hockey game on his iPhone, so let me wrap up. <laughs> and let me come back to Mary Roberts Reinhardt. I think in late January, she sat down to write a piece for the Saturday Evening Post that was published in March of 1917. This is after the, I guess it'll be February, this is after the announcement of unrestricted submarine warfare and after she knew about the Zimmerman telegram. The main point of her argument was that the United States, if it was going to go to war, had to do so equitably. That means no substitutions like in the American Civil War and no draft evasion like in the American Civil War, which is why she wrote, if in this war we allowed the few to fight for us, then as a nation we have died and our ideals have died with us. Though we win, if we all have not borne this burden alike, then do we all lose. And to her, this was personal. When she had come back in March of 1915, her two sons were too young just to fight in the army. Now, by the spring of 1916, the one son was old enough, and the second son would soon be old enough. And she writes later in this piece about how the United States should have been taking preparedness seriously, so that her two sons wouldn't have to join an army utterly unprepared for what it was about to do. But the point that I want to bring is two other things that she wrote here. She wrote, we are virtually at war. By the time this is published, perhaps the declaration will have been made. Now, the declaration is not made, as you know, until April 6th of 1917, but that doesn't mean the American people were waiting for Woodrow Wilson. The state of New York mobilized its National Guard. The state of Massachusetts mobilized its National Guard. Columbia University sent out that memo to the faculty saying it's time for you to go and volunteer those services because we are at war. Philadelphia mobilized its National Guard for fear of sabotage. The American people were not waiting for Woodrow Wilson. Two of Wilson's cabinet members, including his son-in-law, William Gibbs McAdoo, openly wrote that if Wilson did not declare war, the Congress would declare it without him. And if that happened, they would resign from the cabinet. The American people went to war before Woodrow Wilson did. That famous Uncle Sam Wants You poster of James Montgomery Flagg comes out in January of 1917. It comes out before the declaration of war. Woodrow Wilson, in my mind, is not leading a country into war. He's being pushed by a country into war. Britain and France, Mary Roberts Reinhardt wrote, shared a part of the American ideal, what she called the last stand of the humanities on earth, the realization of a dream, and the fulfillment of an ideal. Since 1914, she wrote, they had been fighting for the ideal on which my country was founded. Under the domination of the Prussians, Imperial Germany now threatened those values, not only in Europe, but in America itself. For, if it, for it had broken loose something terrible, something that must be killed or the world dies. Those are powerful words. Something that must be killed or the world dies. That's why the United States went to war in 1917, and that's why the American people went to war in the spring of 1917, not enthusiastically, but because they felt they now had no choice but to enter into this horror of a world war to protect themselves. Thank you very much for your attention. I know an after dinner talk is tough and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And you'll have some questions? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, uh, we've got the two mics here. If anyone wants to ask any questions, we have a few minutes. I know it's late. Or would you rather have that last drink? <coughs> okay, here we go. Uh, I'm Bridget Farley. I'm from Washington State University. And Michael Library, that was a wonderful talk. Fabulous, very helpful. Uh, I just have a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, my, uh, the editor of my very small town paper, from 1914 to 1918, actually before that, uh, exactly followed the, the pattern that you described. <laughs> he was completely, utterly against our being in the war. He covered it very extensively, however, from the outbreak. And it was the Zimmerman telegram that did him in, that, that, that made him blow his top and uh, put him on a path to support the president and go in. So that was, that's exactly what happened to us, and so I'm glad to hear that. It was, it was typical. Uh, secondly, uh, I wondered, you know, you, you made the point that um, probably Americans found it, some Americans found it easier, the prospect of going to war, uh, now that we wouldn't have to go to war with czarist Russia, a notorious autocracy. And I wondered who, who in uh, American public opinion made that point, if not Woodrow Wilson? So it's, it's interesting. I mean, one group that certainly makes that point are Jewish Americans, who at the beginning of yeah. the war are very much pro-German. 
Right, but once the czar is gone, so there's a rabbi named David Price whose diary is in New York City, um, who was in Springfield, Massachusetts. And the day the czar abdicated, he wrote in his diary in huge letters, and he used to write every day, he wrote paragraphs and paragraphs about what was going on in his town. All he wrote on that day was freedom for Jews because the czar was gone. So that's one group that's doing it. Um, American progressives are another group that are doing it. That, you know, if, if this is an opportunity to bring democracy to Russia, then there is a point to all of this suffering. Now, of course, once the Bolsheviks take over, then you know, right. the debate and, gets much more pointed. Right. Uh, but even Theodore Roosevelt is making it, that in, in his own way, that war can be a positive force for change. And the argument is, if you can get a stable Russia, then the argument is, once you get rid of the Kaiser, the Germans don't have to be, forgive, forgive me all of my German colleagues here, the word they use is neurotic. German foreign policy won't have to be neurotic because two democratic states on each other's border won't do what these two states have done. Whether you believe that or not, it's kind of the origin of democratic peace theory, I guess. That's a great point, yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hello, Professor. First off, this is um, an amazing research that you have here. I understand how after November 11th, America would breathe that sigh of relief that there, um, America is safe from invasion. But what I'm having trouble understanding is suddenly <clears throat> um, Wilson does a complete 180 where he wants to be as involved in the world as he can be. What my question is, how much is this Wilson? How much is this Wilson's inner circle who's pushing him? How much of this is the Democrat Party in general who's pushing now for more international participation? So here's what I think it is. I think it is, this is a reason why I think studying the First World War is so important. The debate is, once you're gonna get involved in this war, what is the best way for American power to be used? Is it by tying yourself to international organizations that you hope to lead and frankly dominate, or is it, this is what isolation meant in the 1920s. It doesn't mean bury your head in the sand and forget the world is there. It means you operate independent of international organizations. And that's exactly what the presidential debate in foreign policy was about. This is where that debate comes into sharp focus. So I don't think it's Wilson. I don't think it's the Democratic Party. I think it's two wildly divergent ideas about the best way to conduct American foreign policy. Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, who is chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, are appalled that Wilson would think about putting the U.S. into an international organization where El Salvador gets the same vote the United States gets. They're appalled at that. We're America. It's best for the world if we lead. So th that's what I think is going on. Thank you. And again, the definition of isolation is what's key here. Tim. Professor Cook. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. That was a wonderful talk, and I've uh, had the pleasure of reading your book. I, I, I'm interested in the reception to your message in your book. And, and of course, the United States has gone through a difficult period over the last 15 yeah. years, we'll say, about war and going to war. Um, how is your message getting out there? Because when I read your book, I, I found it very revolutionary. I thought it was convincing. You have the evidence, as you've shown us tonight. Um, is it being received that way? So you and, you and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Um, if I've learned one thing in the centennial of the First World War, it's that the vast majority of people could not care less what actually happened. They want a version of their history that confirms what they already believe. So the two things that I get asked about the most, and I'm very glad nobody in this room asked me about them, um, the so-called anti-war movement, which is a complicated topic in and of itself, although I think it's very small by the time you get to March 1917, um, and the individual unit, the Harlem Hellfighters, which Americans know about, an African-American unit out of, out of New York City. That's all people want to talk about or they want me to make a statement that America was wrong to have gotten involved in the war. And my point is, as an historian, I just don't think that's my call to make. What I can do is explain why they thought they weren't wrong in getting involved. Um, so I would love to be able to stand up and tell you that I've changed the way Americans look at the First World War. That is really, I haven't even changed the way my kids think of the First World War. <laughs> um, but I mean, well, all, all you can do, I guess, as a scholar is hope that those ideas, you know, get out there and that people at least begin the debate. But what I've seen is that most of the stuff that was going on over the past couple of weeks has been confirmation of either the peace, the anti-war people had it right, um, or uh, they want to talk about the Harlem Hellfighters, who are a fantastic story, but completely unrepresentative, of course, of the, the wider body of the United States. Hi, Bill March. I just want to echo, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank at, you. Uh, skewed my thinking on, on the United States and the First World War. My question has to do more with after the war is over. How do you think the, the uh, United States and their culture dealt with 
not only the soldiers that came back, but also those volunteers who fought in foreign services and foreign militaries when they came back home. Yeah. So it's really interesting. You, you can track this fairly well. In the 1920s, there is tremendous pride in the United States at the service in World War I. New York City alone has something like 129 World War I memorials. They're everywhere. It's just that Americans have forgotten where to look for them, but they're everywhere. Um, and the way that I usually tell the story is to look at the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby. In the 1920s, Ga Fitzgerald was so embarrassed that he never got over to France, even though he was in the war, that he bought an old trench helmet and hit it with a hammer and hung it in every house that he lived in. And The Great Gatsby, all of the male characters in that book are defined by their First World War service. The, the good guys, quote unquote, Gatsby and Nick Carraway, are World War I veterans and medal winners, Medal of Honor winners or something. Um, Tom Buchanan ducked the war, and he's the evil villainous guy. Then, right about the time, late 1920s, early 30s, when the Great Depression, the Bonus Army, all of these things start to happen, there's a real switch in American attitudes. It goes to, you know, most of those World War I memorials stop getting built in the 30s, and I think that's more than the Great Depression sucking money away. It's a changed view. It's a belief that we did all this, and it didn't produce the outcome that we wanted. So I think, I think it's, it's a very defensible point to say that in the 1920s, this is a big deal. Military service is a big deal. By the 1930s, it's, you, you know, it's this Smedley Butler that, that they used you to make money. You know, they, they used you. But if I may follow on, I mean, I understand sort of the memorials and the veterans of foreign wars and stuff like this for American servicemen, but how did they treat those 100,000, oh, as oh, you I'm estimate, sorry. how it was served in the foreign services? The Lafayette Escadrille and some of the sort of the, the premier PR names, yeah. but what about the other ones? I've come across no evidence that suggests that they were treated any differently from American veterans in the U.S. Army, except when it, because most of them, what happens to the vast majority of them, when, like the Lafayette Escadrille, when the U.S. gets involved in the war, they break up the Escadrille, and those guys go to various American units except for the couple guys that the U.S. Army would not let them pass the physicals. So they stayed in the French Air Force. Uh, two of them became aces, by the way. Um, and a lot of the American soldiers that were in other armies did the same thing. They, they left their foreign service and came into the U.S. Army. But I, I've seen no evidence that they were treated any differently. Doesn't mean they weren't. I just haven't seen any evidence to it. Yeah, I just, um, a question about the Lusitania, because I remember back in the day, in high school learning, that was a major reason for the United States entering the war. Yeah. And then as an adult, kind of, wait a minute, that was two years before. Right. So why does that incident have such resonance when it's... I think what's happened is we've just missed what the importance of the Lusitania actually was. So the importance of the Lusitania, again, is not that it brought America into the war, it's that it forces Americans to start discussing it. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've made this crack before. I think Tim's even heard it at another conference, but I think there's like a five minute way to explain this. And then there's the one hour way that I just did it. Or if you really want to do it right, it's a whole semester. You have to study progressivism and regionalism and racism and all this stuff. Um, it's just easy to look for, because Americans are used to thinking about there's got to be a trigger, there's got to be a, an event. And in this case, it is the Zimmerman telegram, but that's a much more complicated event to discuss. So I think the Lusitania is really important, just not for the reasons that we've, we've articulated. Um, and, you know, I served on a textbook committee a couple of years, and that's the first thing I did. I opened it to the World War I part, and if it said the Lusitania brought the U.S. into World War I, I put it on the, the no pile. But it's an, it's, it's an easy thing to explain if you have three paragraphs in a textbook to do it. Can we take the last one? Oh, I, I'm in your hand. Right there. I, there's one more. Is there? Yeah. I, uh, my name is Ryan Flavel. I wanted to ask you about um, the motivations of those soldiers who served in other countries' units prior to American entry yeah. in the war. Now, the memoirs that I've seen, like McBride, a rifleman goes to war, is the, is the key, is the big one. But um, seemed to be, I just wanted to go fight in a war. Like yeah. I, it, the, there was a war on, and that's what I wanted to do. How much is it that the Lusitania happened, and so we've got to avenge it? So we're going to join the Canadian Army, and how much of it is? There's a war on, I just want to go fight. So I think adventure is a certainly a big part of it. But again, it's important to me. Um, I, I have found exactly one letter diary memoir collection of someone who had that spirit and said, I'm going to go fight for the Austro-Hungarians, in this case for Austria-Hungary. The, the, the 100,000 are going to Britain and France. Yeah. There's got to be a reason, right? So when men talk about this, now I've come across diaries too where they'll say, look, I just joined up with a bunch of guys 
um, half of them the police are chasing and half of them the pregnant girl's father is chasing them and they're, they're gonna go to France, they're just gonna get out. Um, but you know, the, the members of the Escadrille, the members of some of the foreign leech, they write eloquently about their love of Britain, their love of France, the need to protect democracy. They were there for us, we have to be there for them. That's why it's called the Lafayette Escadrille, you know, after the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, so, you know, if it's 100,000 to one, and that's exaggerating it, but not by a lot, there's a reason, there's a reason. Um, now again, I mean, like I said, there are some of these guys who are clearly trying to get as far away from home as possible for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but they're doing it in the French and British Army. They're not doing it in the German or Austro-Hungarian. There's got to be a reason for that. One more. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, sure. <clears throat> we have a Canadian writer who was born in the States named uh, Diane Francis. <clears throat> and she is of the view that the, the um, super-militarism and the ultra-patriotism in the United States, uh, or many Americans now, derives from their German Germanic background. <laughs> No, is that, would you believe, is there any truth to that in no, your mind? I would have a hard time buying that. So, you know, so what, so what, you, what you say is interesting because the German-American community gets tarred both with being super militarist and it gets tarred with being the neutral pacifist keep us out of this war, mm -hmm. right? And it's a big diverse community, so it's, you know, both of those voices are certainly there. Uh, the people who are, who are really pushing early, that is pre-Lusitania, for America to get in the war are people like Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who in this time period would have been called Native Americans, which means that they're white Anglo-Saxon Protestants with British blood. You know, they're, they're, they're the first group that really starts pushing. Um, and in, in the book, I have a chapter where I look at German Americans, Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, and the transformation that they make from 1914 to 1917. But no, I don't think I would, I would have to see a lot of evidence to be convinced that German Americans are more militarist than anybody else. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget. Yeah, well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, sir. And uh, I didn't know anybody was still playing hockey, Michael. Yeah, they are, I guess. Mike, Mike gave me the thumbs oh, Okay, I, I thought our hockey season ended last week. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, tomorrow morning, 8.30, continental breakfast, 9 o'clock, we start our sessions. I will be here. Nancy will be phoning me at 7.30. Good night.